Our first speaker, I'm very happy to introduce, is a writer whose articles, poetry, and fiction have appeared in the New York Times, in Book Forum, in the Los Angeles Review of Books and other journals. He's the editor-at-large for Cabinet Magazine, and his latest book is Stefan Zweig, At the End of the World. He recently wrote an article for The New Yorker entitled, When It's Too Late to Stop Fascism. I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a warm welcome to George Prochnik. Thanks so much for having me to this event. Um, I'm going to try to give a little historical lens on the threat that we face. And to begin that, I want to read something not by Stefan Zweig, but from Primo Levi, who was an Italian chemist and eventually a survivor of Auschwitz. He wrote a very, uh, one of the greatest memoirs that exists about that experience. And he wrote the following. We must be listened to above and beyond our personal experiences. We have collectively witnessed a fundamental, unexpected event. Fundamental precisely because unexpected, not foreseen by anyone. It took place in the teeth of all forecasts. It happened that an entire civilized people followed a buffoon whose figure today inspires laughter. And yet Adolf Hitler was obeyed and his praises were sung right up to the catastrophe. It happened, therefore it can happen again. That is the core of what I have to tell you. I want to come back at some point. I hope someone will ask a question about that idea of the buffoon, because I actually think that's very important in terms of how Trump, is, Trump has been perceived, and to an extent how he's been normalized. But Stefan Zweig, um, the man that I wrote about, was a person of enormous affluence and influence, an Austrian Jew who was born uh, at the end of the 19th century, and by the late 1920s was the most widely translated author in the world. A huge bestseller. His films were made into movies. He wrote novels, essays, poetry, libretti, plays. He also grew up in a very wealthy family in Vienna's most privileged district, the first district on the Ringstrasse. This was a person who felt himself absolutely immune to histories, to political turbulence. And within a very short period of time, within, in fact, less than 10 years from the point at which he was the most widely translated author in the world, Stefan Zweig's books were being burned, and he himself was on the run from not just Hitler, but the overall resurgence of an intense militant nationalism that came about with the ascendancy of fascism. To give just a little background on his exile, because it's germane to the book that he wrote, the memoir that he wrote, that I want to focus on and what I have to say. In 1934, in the winter of 1934, there was a brief civil war in Austria. It's an event that not many people who don't study the period know much about. It took place over just a period of a few weeks, but it effectively gutted the Austrian, the very powerful and very effective Austrian Socialist Party. It was essentially a, a battle between the socialists and various reactionary forces allied with the then cleroco-fascist leader of, of Austria, someone named Dolphus, who wasn't himself at that point aligned with Hitler, who was in fact trying to keep um, Austria from being annexed by Germany, but had his own homegrown version of fascism and felt sufficient pressure from the more reactionary elements in his party to, that, that, he, that he felt he could no longer allow socialism to exist as a viable movement in, in Austria. And once he managed to essentially destroy the party by either arresting people or driving them into various forms of exile and killing many hundreds, 
the road was open for, um, for Hitler, Hitler's annexation of the country in 1938. Stefan Zweig, when that civil war took place, was based in Salzburg, which is just over the border from Germany. He himself had been working for years at that point to promote humanism. He was one of the best known pacifists in the world. He had a home on a hill, in fact, overlooking Salzburg, a very exposed position. Nonetheless, at one point as the war was winding down, his home was searched by the local police for guns. They, there was a suspicion that he might be hiding arms for, to be distributed to the socialists. And he knew at that point that if one of the best known pacifists in the world could be accused of harboring a secret weapons cache at the same time that he also was in an incredibly exposed position, that he himself was going to be endangered in no short order. And the very next day, he got on a train and headed to England, which was the first stop in an exile that careened all over the world eventually. He was, he was in, first in London, then in Bath, England, then in New York, then in Ossinic, New York, then in Rio de Janeiro, and then at last in Petropolis, Brazil, just above Rio, about an hour above Rio in the hills, where he killed himself in February of 1942. But the summer before he killed himself, he was just up the Hudson from where those of us in New York City are today, not very far at all. He lived, in fact, about a mile uphill from Sing Sing Prison. And I've often thought what it would have been like for him going back and forth on the train from New York City and having the sight of that massive fortress as a reminder of what was happening to his, his people and to all of Europe at that point in time. While he was in Austria, excuse me, in Ossining, in that summer of 1942, he wrote at a furious pace the first draft of his autobiography, The World of Yesterday. But it's not a typical memoir. It has almost no intimate personal details of his life. Instead, what he was trying to do was to create a kind of message in the bottle to the future, to give indications about what aspects of civilization needed to be watched because they could pivot into something, some kind of heinous form of totalitarianism, and also to give some, some index, index of what might be points of hope, what, what were aspects of the evolution of Europe that he'd lived through, which if they'd been cultivated might have prevented Hitler's rise. He managed to write literally something like 300 pages in a matter of less than a month. He was writing in this feverish pace. He never left this very, very small, very grim bungalow that he lived in. And it's amazing to think of this man who'd been at the center of all sorts of different European movements aimed at promoting humanism. Redu it reduced to this very, very contracted existence, almost no social life in this tiny little house in this town that for him was in the middle of nowhere. But I think it gave him a certain fiery clarity, gave his remarks a real passion that it merits revisiting today, because he tried to trace what he had missed. It's a very, it's a very modest book in many ways. One of, the, one of the points that he makes right away is that he can't remember when he first heard Hitler's name. He doesn't know where that, the whole movement associated with Hitler and even preceding Hitler in terms of Italian fascism, where it began to be a real issue. One of the points Zweig makes is that in these periods where there is uh, an, an intense upsurge of nationalist reactionary elements, there are going to be many little figures, any one of whom might be the one who from some bizarre confluence of circumstances ends up being the dictator to watch. And I've, thought about this for a number of reasons in terms of what we're seeing today, partly because horrific as this administration is, we don't know that Trump is the person who is going to really take things all the way over the edge. And I think it behooves all of us to be very vigilant about other figures who may seem absolutely marginal today, but who are garnering some kind of support in some little corner and may ultimately have, if not a charisma, some magnetic message, some way to channel a very dark will amongst, amongst the masses. So 
what does Zweig tell us to watch out for? One thing he says, and he, and he remarks on this long before Hitler, again, was the chancellor of Germany, but when fascism was gaining power. He, he writes of seeing the little groups of young conscripts to the National Socialist Movement moving through town in these beautiful limousines, in very, very fancy cars, trucks, and spanky new uniforms. Very, 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 very well decked out. In other words, they were well financed. And I think it's always good in, a, you know, in the old Marxist adage to follow the money. And so one thing with this administration, and it's more, more I don't know what the right word is, more virulently activist elements, is to look at what is being funded. He says the second thing to watch out for and maybe the most important aspect of what we witnessed in this last election is the power of propaganda, right? And, and it's not just propaganda to spread a lie, to ins ignite a frenzy among the core followers. It's also propaganda that can serve to distract and cover up the actions, where, that, the actions that the administration, that the party is focused on really managing to bring through to fruition. I thought a lot about this issue of distraction in this last campaign, even apart from the message of hate. I think if the planet survives another 100 years, survives this man and his, and his like-minded cohort, I suspect that people will look back on the 2016 election as a real watershed in the distraction of the electorate, partly technologically induced ADD. I mean, there, there can't have been any campaign before where there could be one outrage after another, which would just seem to evaporate within days, partly because the mainstream media didn't continue covering it, but also because people seemed unable to hold in their heads the jumble of the sheer volume of outrages, but also the sheer volume and barrage of different kinds of information that were being fed through them, through this feed that we seem all too addicted to. There, there, there was a remark that really rang through my head from Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who noted that when the Constitution was being framed in Independence Hall, the authors of that document had the road in front of, of Independence Hall covered with straw so that the sound of the coach wheels would be muffled and wouldn't disturb their, their debates, their discussions. And if, I, if we think about that level of attention and the absolute diffraction of our minds today, I think we all have to do everything we can to spend time off all devices and really trying to think as hard as we can to just think about what's going on in the most, in the most concentrated way possible. Um, along with propaganda, the money, and the charismatic leader that in some sense we have to acknowledge Trump is, Zweig makes the point that the Nazi party was able to introduce its measures as effectively as it did because it took the approach of giving one poison pill at a time. It didn't try, the party didn't try, in other words, to throw everything on at once and just disorient people. There was an effort to see how each new measure would take and when the European body politic gave sufficient resistance to a measure, they'd back off and wait, and then give another pill. It was one pill at a time until Zweig writes, people were so inured to the effects of the poison that they were willing essentially to embrace the, the, the apocalypse. Finally, on this issue of Trump's character and, and the idea which I think resonates very profoundly with what we've seen of the buffoon, I can't tell you how many writers, activists, thinkers of the 1930s wrote about their experience of Hitler initially having been an experience of such a fool that they could not believe that this man should be taken seriously. Um, 
the son of Thomas Mann, Klaus Mann, who was himself an important writer and progressive thinker, described an experience where he was sitting in a, in a Bavarian tea house at one point, and he realized Hitler was at another table with a few of his henchmen. And he was there consuming these little cakes in this unbelievably boorish manner, stuffing his face. And Mann says that he looked at this man, at this petite bourgeoisie figure, this embodiment of just a kind of vile piggishness, and said, there's nothing to worry about. He can't possibly cause us a problem. Zweig writes about how when Hitler's writings were, began to be circulated, the, how the, his sheer inarticulateness, his inability to make an effective argument, to, to say anything with force, made the intellectuals just dismiss him in exactly the same way. I worry that all of the ways that Trump has shown himself willing to play the fool, to, to be a clown, to show, to display his intellectual mediocrity, has allowed sometimes for a, a kind of snarkiness to overtake a real analysis of what he's doing, of all of the little measures on top of the big threats that he makes. I think it's been, what, however intentionally or not, it doesn't matter, it's been an incredibly effective smokescreen. Everyone has so much to mock that the fact that he does exactly what he says he does, that he has to be taken both seriously and literally, gets lost. In Zweig's memoir, he goes through a whole slew of different stages that darkened the canvas in Europe. And he says, finally, that one thing was still missing. This is after Hitler's ascendancy. He said, even when Hitler became chancellor, people still, and he counts himself among the people, had no notion, no notion whatsoever of what was coming. Not a clue. For all that they were aware that they had put in, that Germany had put in power an incredibly dangerous, unpredictable person with incredibly vicious rhetoric, there was not a hint of what was to come. So what was the moment for Zweig that really tipped events into some irretrievable, disastrous abyss? That was uh, the Reichstag fire, the burning of the German parliament building that happened less than 30 days after Hitler became chancellor. This was a fire that there's been speculation may have even been ignited by Nazis, the Nazis themselves, no lives were lost. It was the destruction of a symbolic edifice. But it became the excuse for Hitler to suspend all pretense of due legal process. Everything from that point on became an emergency measure. Of course, it seems to me that we already see signs of Trump looking for that act of terror, either false or actual, exaggerated or not, that gives him the excuse to suspend any kind of judicial responsibility. I worry profoundly about that. And it's one of the reasons that I think so far from ever allowing this administration to be normalized, it has to be resisted at every single step, in every single executive order has to be protested. There, the minute that an agenda that we know has such an enormous tide of hatred behind it is in any way allowed to become business as usual, I think that the opportunity for bursting out with some massive atrocity that changes the, the ball game overnight is huge. You know, people are still making a lot of money in this administration, while this administration's in power. That's one of the reasons that the GOP has shown itself so spineless. Until the economics are disrupted, 
I think it's going to be very, very hard to really get at him. But if people boycott goods, if they block roads, if, if, if the people who make Trump possible start feeling this is not working out so well economically, maybe we can avoid that, that catastrophic last moment. You know, Zweig teaches us that there is, in fact, a, a window in which it's possible to act. But once that comes down, you're in a whole other reality, and there's no way out. And I hope that all of us do everything in our power to seize this hour now. We do still have the power to act. Things aren't yet set in stone, and it's all of our responsibility to do everything we can to fight. Thank you.